Welcome back to the P3 Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Talisha Reeve, and today we're going to be discussing how we can utilize the win-last test to better guide our exercise selection for our patients that are suffering plantar fasciopathy. So in clinical practice, there's often a disconnect between various elements of knowledge and the application of knowledge. So in this example, we're talking about diagnostic or objective tests and exercise selection. So the main points that we're going to be talking about today is how we can use these tests to get more information, which will subsequently allow us to create more individualization and hopefully more consistent outcomes with our musculoskeletal management programming. So let's get into it. The Progressive Podiatry Project, here to share knowledge, insights and information for you to improve your clinical practice and most importantly, help you help your clients. Now, many clinicians may utilize an objective test to identify what pathology they're dealing with. However, many seem to stumble when it comes to figuring out how to actually use this information to aid with the selection and timing of their therapeutic interventions that may be beneficial to aid their client's recovery. So essentially, the end result of us being able to prescribe exercises based on the individual and hopefully achieve more consistent outcomes is we move our thought process away from prescribing an exercise for a pathology and realize that we're prescribing exercises for a person who has a pathology. So firstly, what is the win-last test? So the win-last test was coined by Hicks in 1954, and you can perform this test either non-weight bearing or weight bearing. And when we're performing this, we Essentially, we're dorsiflexing the hallux to engage the windlass. So the result of this dorsiflexion of the hallux, the movement results in the plantar fascia winding around the metatarsal heads, which once the windlass is engaged, subsequently this shortens the distance between the heel and the forefoot, resulting in the elevation of the longitudinal arch. Now, a little technique tip for you is when we're performing this test and we're dorsiflexing the hallux, we want to ensure that we're plantar flexing the interphalangeal joint of the hallux to take flexor hallucis longus out of the equation. So this slight plantar flexion of the IPJ of the hallux will slacken flexor hallucis longus. So then when we're dorsiflexing the hallux or the proximal phalanx, it's going to be applying the tension specifically to the plantar fascia. Now, when we talk about the clinical utility of the Winlass test, it's often used to aid in the diagnosis of plantar fasciopathy. So essentially, when pain is reproduced at the plantar medial calcaneal tubercle by performing the Winlass test, this is considered to be a positive for this test. Now, when we have a little bit of a closer look at the sensitivity and specificity of a test, the sensitivity is reported to be around 32%, with the specificity being 100%. So remember, sensitivity is the test's level of accurately identifying someone with a pathology or disease, and specificity is the test level of accuracy in identifying someone without a pathology or a disease. So essentially, if you don't have plantar fasciopathy, then it's almost 100% certain that you won't test positive for this pathology. However, if you do have plantar fasciopathy, there's only a sort of 32-ish percent chance that this test will yield a positive response. So it can't be used entirely for diagnostics. There's other information that we need to gather to accurately identify if someone does have plantar fasciopathy. So to get a little bit more bang for buck out of this exercise, if you will, We want to move beyond utilizing this test to tell us if a patient is or isn't experiencing plantar fasciopathy. We can actually use this information to identify a potential starting point for physical rehabilitation if it's required. Now, for a bit of background, in 2015, Michael Rathleff published a brilliant paper that high load strength training improves outcomes in patients with plantar fasciitis. And then there was a subsequent follow up paper a few years later that was looking a little bit more at the dosage components of this exercise. Now, I think it changed the game for plantar fasciopathy rehabilitation. 
But as with many publications that take us a leap forward, a problem began where clinicians would begin prescribing almost all of their plantar fasciopathy patients the high load strength training exercises. And then a few problems began to arise. So the problem with this exercise, like all exercises, the application can significantly overdose or underdose someone if we're not considering the client's current load tolerating capacity. So if we have someone who is, say, a high functioning runner and we're prescribing the high load strength training exercise, it may not actually provide sufficient stimulus for the tissue adaptations that we're after to return them to their desired activities. And in contrast, if we have someone that's got a relatively reactive or highly reactive plantar fascia and we prescribe the high load strength training, we can actually overdose them. So if we're prescribing a high load exercise to someone with a low load tolerance, we're asking for a flare. So whenever we're prescribing an exercise, we should be focusing on function. So we should be considering the capacity gap, which is essentially the person's desired capacity. So what activities they want to be returning to their current capacity, so what can they actually do at present relative to their desired activities, which this subsequently gives us the capacity gap. So it gives us a little bit of a framework and a map as far as what we need to follow to get them from where they currently are to where they want to be. So this is where we should be focusing on function. So functionally, what do we want or need to achieve? And then functionally, what can we currently achieve? And then we need to be prescribing with what they currently can do, but have the goal of what they want to get back to at the forefront. And then that's what influences our exercise selection, our exercise dosage programming, and then how many steps we may go through in the micro versus macro cycle to help the person achieve their goal. So the first step to prescribe to address functional deficits is to understand the structure and the function of the affected tissue and then understand how it's meant to function in or relative to the desired activity. So if we're looking at the plantar fascia through the exercise prescription lens, It's a tissue comprised primarily of type 1 collagen, which type 1 collagen serves to absorb and release elastic strain energy to aid in propulsion during gait. Now, the magnitudes of tensile strain tolerance and also the amount that the plantar fascia needs to store and release this mechanical strain energy, it will vary depending on the type of activity. So in this example, we're talking about walking versus running. So it's Yes, going to be a bit of a difference between walking and running because we have changes in ground contact time, but also the velocity of movements, which subsequently alter the internal magnitudes of stresses. So when we're running at faster speeds, there's going to be a higher degree of internal stress and tensile load placed on the plantar fascia relative to walking. So it's not just the tissue itself, it's also the intensity of movement or applied load that we need to consider in our exercise programming. So if we think of plyometric exercises, if we have an 85 year old walker who they just want to get back to their activities of daily living and have their plantar heel pain settle to a point that they can take their dog for a 15 minute walk each morning. The amount of stress that the plantar fascia needs to tolerate is going to be vastly different to someone who's an elite runner who's wanting to return to a running mileage of 160 kilometers a week with speed sessions where they're running at paces of sort of 16 to 20 kilometers an hour for some of their interval sessions. So it's again, not just walking and walking and running and running. It's also the intensity of those activities within that activity that should be formulating or be part of our considerations when it comes to our exercise prescriptions. And then when we look at the underlying cause of plantar fasciopathy, it is thought to be or follow a very similar pathway to tendinopathy. And imaging and histopathological findings, it does to an extent support this theory. 
So in the presence of plantar fasciopathy, we see a number of structural changes occurring. So angiofibroblastic hyperplasia, which is essentially a combination of fiber disorientation, an increase in myxoid ground substance, and there's also an absence of inflammatory infiltrate. And this is, again, very consistent with what we see in tendinopathy presentations. And so given especially the fiber disorientation and the increases in ground substance, we see these changes often interfering with the tissue's ability to store and release mechanical strain energy. And it also demonstrates or exhibits a decrease in strain load tolerance. So it stands to reason that if these are the functional deficits that often present, then our therapeutic intervention should aim to address and improve these functional deficits. So how can we address this? The first thing is, as always, like Greg Lehman says, is we need to calm shit down before we can build shit up. So in some people, their level of reactivity, or and I say reactivity because, again, not all plantar fasciopathy or Achilles tendinopathy presentations are inflamed. So if we talk about reactivity, it encapsulates a number of things. So it may be an inflamed tissue, or it may be a tissue that has just a very low tolerance to mechanical load. So it's reactive. You experience pain or discomfort with the application of mechanical stress. So for some people, if it is a highly reactive tissue, our initial interventions may be trying to calm down that reactivity in order for us to open the therapeutic window into meaningful movement. So then if we're looking at how we can improve the functional deficits, it's, well, essentially, how can we address this? We need to expose the tissue to mechanical loads that replicate the function of the tissue, but we need to do this in line with the current load tolerating capacity. So essentially, we need to be exposing the tissue to strain loads and loads that require the storage and release of mechanical energy because that's the function that we're trying to restore in most instances. So then we need to apply a therapeutic dose of exercise or movement to allow the positive tissue adaptations to occur. Now, it's usually at this point that panic begins to set in with clinicians and it's, okay, well, what is the best exercise in order for me to achieve this? Now, the answer is it varies for everyone and that's not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. So when we talk about the cellular changes that we're after that help facilitate the remodeling and restoration of the tendon or the fascia tissues, we're talking about a couple of different processes. So firstly, we've got the enzymes that govern the collagen synthesis and degradation processes. So our matrix metalloproteinases and our tissue inhibitors of matrix metalloproteinases. And then we also have the expression of lysoloxidase, which lysoloxidase governs the formation of collagen crosslinks. And this influences the ratio or the level of tissue stiffness, stiffness and compliance. So how much deformation occurs with the application of load. Now with the plantar fascia and also most of our tendons, especially our energy storage tendons, we do tend to want them to be stiffer in most instances because that allows more energy to be stored and released and decreases the stresses on surrounding tissues, our muscles, our bones, etc. Now, the good news is stretching, isometric exercises, our isotonics, which are our concentrics and our eccentrics, and then our plyometrics, they will all trigger these adaptations to occur which is great. So when we're looking at restoring function, this is how we can begin to restore someone's functional capacity relative to their current capacity. Because if they've got a very low load tolerating capacity, we don't need to be prescribing the high load strengthening, which is tends to be more of an eccentric focused movement. So yes, the eccentrics will trigger bigger adaptations or bigger responses to the, um, tissue inhibitors of matrix metalloproteinases and the matrix metalloproteinases, it will trigger greater changes in the expression of lysoloxidase. So the more intense the movement or the more load applied with the movement, the more profound the tissue effects at a cellular level will be. 
but this isn't to say that we can't achieve that with stretching. So we don't need to jump into really high load exercises to trigger these really profound tissue changes because even starting with low dose, low load exercises will begin the processes of positive adaptation. So the few questions that we need to ask ourselves so we can avoid overdosing or underdosing our exercise rehabilitation is firstly, what's my client's desired functional capacity? So what activities are we looking to restore them or return them to? Then we need to think about what's their current functional capacity. So what can they do at this point in time relative to their desired activities? And then this is how we begin to prescribe with purpose when we answer this question is, how am I going to help them bridge that capacity gap? So for some people, in order to bridge the capacity gap, exercise therapies won't be required. We may simply need to give some load management advice or a load management program. We may be implementing footwear or orthoses in addition to exercise therapies. It varies for everyone. So for some, exercise therapies may make up none of the program or a small part of the program. For others, exercises may be the cornerstone of their rehabilitation program. So regardless of the intervention, essentially we need to expose the tissue, the plantar fascia, to mechanical strain loads that will trigger the positive tissue adaptations that are required to facilitate the collagen remodeling process and restore the function of the plantar fascia. Now, shameless plug, if you do want to do the ultimate deep dive into plantar fasciopathy and its rehabilitation concepts and how we can use exercises, footwear, orthoses, all of the above, we do have the plantar fasciopathy rehabilitation masterclass, which you can find more information about this at progressivepodiatryproject.com forward slash PF masterclass. But anyway, moving on from that. So essentially the windlass test, especially if we're performing the non-weight bearing windlass test, it applies a very low degree of tensile strain load on the plantar fascia. So if the windlass test yields a positive response, that is pain or discomfort is experienced when we're applying that passive tension to the plantar fascia, I would not begin with the high load strengthening exercise as it may overdose the loading of the tissue. So initially it may be some treatment interventions to try and just help ambulation. So it may be some strapping, it may be heel lifts, it may be footwear with a stiffer midsole or a decrease in midsole bending stiffness and a slight forefoot rocker and or orthoses. It might be a combination. Again, it's highly, highly individual what we may need. But then if we're looking at prescribing some exercises, I typically start with some low load exercises. So again, this is because a positive win last test, especially non-weight bearing, will demonstrate a low tolerance for strain loads. So our exercises need to apply a lower degree of strain loads that are in line with the load tolerating capacities. So it is normal when we're prescribing exercises for rehabilitation of plantar fasciopathy or tendinopathy to experience some low degree of discomfort. Pain is not ideal, we don't want that, but a little bit of discomfort is normal. So for me, if the windlass test yields a positive response, that is discomfort at the plantar fascia origin when we're applying the passive tensile loads, whether or not it's weight bearing or non-weight bearing, it's still a very low load test. But in this example, let's say we're doing the non-weight bearing windlass test. So a positive result, I would not begin with a high load strengthening exercise in any of its variations as this may overdose the loading of the tissue. So depending on the rest of the clinical profile of the patient, there may be other interventions that I put in place for them. It may be some tensile strapping of the plantar fascia. There may be some fat pad strapping if we think there might be a little bit of a compressive driven element. It may be looking at their footwear. Do they need a shoe that has a decrease in midsole bending stiffness with a bit of a forefoot rocker? It depends for everyone. So we take in a lot of other information from our clinical history. And just on that, I do have that free plantar fasciopathy rehabilitation guide, which kind of helps clinicians work through the process of trying to identify 
what the most appropriate treatment interventions may be for that individual at that point in time. So to get, and it's a completely free resource, and you can get it at progressivepodiatryproject.com forward slash PF. RG. So it just works through a little bit of a step-by-step process as far as some questions to ask. Are we dealing with a compressive or a tensile-driven pathology? When would I be doing functional tests? What would I be reviewing? Et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully it just gives you a little bit more of a guide as to where you may be able to individualize your management a little bit better. But essentially, if the win-last test yields a positive response, like I said, I wouldn't begin with the high load strengthening because it may overdose. So I would typically start with some low load exercises as a positive win-last test demonstrates a low load tolerance for strain loads. So I may start with some first met stretching or we may do a seated calf raise or seated ankle pumps or seated ankle range of movement. It's all the same thing. It's just terms used interchangeably. So with this exercise, the person is literally sitting and they're just performing some passive calf raises. So no external resistance is applied. They're just moving the ankle and the um, metatarsal joints through varying degrees of flexion and extension. And then this may progress to the heel rocker weight transition focus, either with the foot flat or the digits extended on the fasciitis fighter. So this exercise I definitely have put out on all of the social media platforms quite a lot and it is included in the exercise library as part of the plantar fasciopathy rehab masterclass course. But essentially this is where I may start someone if that's what their initial functional tests or load tolerating tests give us an indication of what their ceiling of tolerance is. So eventually we may build up to the high load strengthening exercise or after symptoms begin to resolve, depending on what their goal activities are, we may simply program a gradual return to exposure to their usual activities. So the main takeaway here is that we, A, need to prescribe for the person, not just the pathology. B, we should be prescribing exercises that will address the functional deficits that are present at that point in time. And then we should be progressing a client through exercises that replicate their goal functional goal activities. And then lastly, we just need to ensure that our exercises and the subsequent dosages of these prescribed exercises will apply sufficient stress to create positive adaptations in order for our client's tissues to tolerate the applied loads that will occur when they return to their usual activities. And again, so we need to hopefully leave them better than when we found them. So we don't want to prescribe exercises that have someone being able to tolerate walking, but they can't tolerate running if running is the desired activity that they want to get back to. So we just need to, again, prescribe with purpose. So hopefully this has shared some insights into how we can utilize the win last test beyond purely diagnostics. And if you do want to find out more about the plantar fasciopathy rehabilitation masterclass online course, again, you can head to progressivepodiatryproject.com forward slash PF masterclass. And I would really like to hear some feedback. So whatever platform that you're accessing this on, if you're able to leave a comment, if not, shout out at uh, p3podiatry at gmail.com or on our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, leave a comment there. Um, It's been great. I'll catch you next time. Cheers. Mm -hmm.